Hello everybody, I'm Tara Hoffman, the president of AFS USA, and I'm really pleased to be here today with Joan Siegel. Um, and we'll talk about Joan's background in a, in a second, but part of our celebratory initiatives around the 75th anniversary is to hear a lot of our AFS returnees, volunteers, host families, stories. And so we asked Joan if she um, would like to sit down with me and have a kind of fireside local chat about her experiences with AFS. And, um, you know, wherever I go in the country or even in the world, whenever you just mention AFS and people think about their experiences, their faces light up. And I think it's such an important testimony to the 75th anniversary that we tell some of these stories. And in particular with Joan, we wanted to feature her story because you've had quite a path with AFS. You've had many different experiences and your life has been influenced in so many ways. So thank you for joining us today. Yeah, you're welcome. So here we are in Chevy Chase, Maryland, in your beautiful home. Thank you for welcoming us. And Joan, could you start by telling us a little bit about your first experience with AFS? You are a returnee, and I think came from a family that was very supportive of AFS. So could you shed a little bit of light on that? Oh, sure. So uh, I grew up in Billings, Montana, and we had a very active AFS chapter in my high school. Um, and the two Spanish teachers at the high school ran the AFS chapter, and I was taking Spanish. And the year, it was a three-year high school, so when I was a sophomore, we had three really incredible AFS students. Um, I think they were from Italy and Germany, and I think Costa Rica. And I looked at that, and I thought, ooh, I want that. And so I applied. And um, back then, uh, most of the matching up was done in the office in New York. So I ended up going to Japan and a lot of people say to me, you know, why did you choose Japan? And the truth is I didn't, it was chosen for me, but I never had any regrets. Um, it was on my list. I had five countries that I wrote down. I had done some research and I was a cellist and I wanted to go someplace where I thought I might be able to play the cello in school. So I applied to Japan, Australia, New Zealand, Kenya, and I think Brazil. And I was also looking at sort of school years that didn't mean that I would miss my entire senior year. <laughs> so I left off Europe. <laughs> and so Japan was both a complete surprise and, and not because it had been on my list. Um, and off I went, I went in April of my junior year and came back in March of my senior year. So I didn't entirely miss my senior year. Right. And I know everybody says this, but it completely changed my life. It was just mind boggling. The differences and the, how much I grew in that year. And then what it led to, because right. after I came back, I went off to the University of Oregon where I could study both cello and Japanese. And I eventually gave up the cello. I wasn't that good, it turned out, and went full on with Japanese and I added German as well, but mostly the focus was Japanese. And then I got a job with Solomon Brothers in New York City, just on the basis of my language degree. <laughs> And they were looking for people who had language to work in their back office. And I went through a few months of training and then was sent to London to work with clients in Europe who were doing business on the Tokyo Stock Exchange. And that allowed me to go back and forth to Tokyo several times, which was very exciting for a 24 year old. And so I did that for a few years and then eventually I tired of the finance scene and I, I was looking for something else to do and I got married and my husband and I ended up in Boston and he said, you should get a master's. So I applied to Harvard and they had, I think they still do, a very um, 
unscheduled, unfettered master's degree that I could do. Basically, I could do anything I wanted to that had something to do with East Asia. So I just took every class they had in history and literature and linguistics and politics, and I did that for two years. So Joan, so many returnees are alumni, you know, for those maybe young external to APHIS, our alumni are returnees. When you came back from Japan and had this, you know, amazing experience, um, what was that experience to re-enter? Because you said you, you made a point to come back, right, to finish high school. <clears throat> but also, how did you then decide you wanted to pursue this, you know, higher education and I guess potentially a career, right, with a Japanese? What, what made you think about that? Yeah. And we talk a lot about language acquisition, but I think most AFSers would say when they say to change their lives, it's not only about the language, right? It's right, like, yeah. For me, probably the language played a larger role, even than some of the other students that were with me in Tokyo, or in, I wasn't in Tokyo, that were with me in Japan. Um, and I've thought a lot about this. It might be because I was raised by a mother who really never wasted anything. My attitude was, I have spent a year trying to acquire this language and I don't wanna waste that. Um, it was a difficult re-entry though, I will say. Uh, high school in Japan is different. Um, I had a short period of time with the rest of my senior class. Uh, and over the years, interestingly, I've discovered things that I missed out on. So for example, I never read Shakespeare <laughs> because that's what we did our senior year. Yeah. And I never studied your, uh, world history. But, you know, that's, that was a small price to pay. Um, but it was, it was a little hard to come back and I had to apply to colleges. It's not like today where you go and visit a zillion and then choose another half a zillion and, and apply it. You know, I applied to two schools. I had chosen the University of Oregon as a cellist because there was a professor there I wanted to study with. And the bonus was that they had Japanese. Yeah. And um, so when I got in, it was an easy fit for me. Um, and my professor told me on day one, my cello professor, that if I was getting A's in any of my other classes, I wasn't practicing enough. Oh, <laughs> and that, that did not um, endear him to me, actually, because I was not one to not get good grades. I figured I could do both. And I could do both, but the truth was I was not all that talented as a cellist. And the language really spoke to me. And so I, you know, I got right into that and, and really focused on it, really wanted to speak it. And did you maintain a relationship with your Japanese host family where you could continue I even using your language did, in that? Yeah. Not, so not immediately. Um, it's funny, I remember when there were 50 of us that flew back from Tokyo into San Francisco. And when we landed, we spontaneously broke out into applause. We were all so glad to be home. Mm -hmm. And if I think hard enough, I can remember that for about a year, I sort of pushed mm -hmm. back on some of the memories, but gradually I started to embrace them and, and make the most of them. But it was difficult to reach out to my family because writing in Japanese oh, right. was mm -hmm. very hard. Right. Um, however, I had a couple of opportunities to go to Japan when I was still in school. And, and I always reconnected with them. And then after I started working for Solomon and traveling, I was also able to see them. And so just through work mostly, I did maintain the relationship to the point where um, subsequently when I went to work for the government um, and we ended up in Tokyo for three years at the embassy and my daughters know my Japanese sister and consider her to be an aunt and we went down well I don't even know how many times we went we went to see them when, when we were living in Tokyo so yeah they're definitely still a major part of the family my my Japanese mother sadly has passed away but my my Japanese dad is still alive mostly he sits in his room smoking and watching TV <laughs> but he still alive and and you know i hear from my sister fairly frequently facebook and you know social media makes that a lot easier 
So often when we're talking with students or their parents and they're debating whether they should go and there's you know often this question of what will I miss? Should I go? Am I going to miss out? And at the same time, we at AFS, you know, we're talking about this is a long-term investment. Right? Yeah. yeah. And that this experience is so valuable for career readiness, yeah. for global competency. Could you speak to how you feel this experience just, you know, impacted you, your, your persona, say, and sort of how to sure. embrace? So, I mean, as I already mentioned, you know, no Shakespeare, no world history, but how do I describe it? Just personal growth mm -hmm. is is really immeasurable in many ways. And um, I mean, maybe maybe I can give an example of how it's had an impact, not just on me, but on my my husband and my kids. So as I mentioned, we spent three years in Tokyo at the embassy. I was in the econ section doing oil and gas, which was not my um, area of expertise, but that's what I was doing. And in the meantime, my husband um, was hired away from his firm to open up a Tokyo office for a new firm and has gone on to become a bit of a Japan-China specialist and now sits on the Mansfield Foundation board, which is special in a couple of ways. It, it, it amuses me that my husband from Connecticut is the one who's sitting on the Mansfield <laughs> Foundation board because Mike Mansfield, for those of you don't, who don't know, was a 25 year senator for the state of Montana and then went on to be, I think the longest, the, still the longest serving or one of the longest serving ambassadors to Japan. <laughs> And then the Japan Foundation was founded, and my Connecticut-born husband, not his Montana-born wife, is sitting on the board. Um, and my kids, too, I think both that the experience that they had in Japan have led them to the work that they're doing. So my older daughter is working for the Veterans Administration as a research assistant, and that connection was because living on the compound in Tokyo, she was surrounded by Marines and never would have had any interaction probably with the military otherwise. And so now she's working on a, a research grant. They are looking at eating disorders mm -hmm. in, in soldiers. And my younger daughter is doing international relations, right? So so that's, that's the impact that's had on my family. Um, I never felt like I gave up anything. I felt like I've only gained. Um, because the interest in being overseas expands, uh, meeting people from other cultures is is neither um, frightening nor daunting. You know, it's it's natural, I think, and more, I'm just naturally curious about about others. Um, I I love the AFS mission because the mission is that we once we understand each other, we'll all get along better. I mean, I, it, all of that is so important to improving the world that we live in. Um, so it's, I think it's hard as a teenager to step away from your friends and your school life and so on. But if you can look beyond those years at the impact that the experience will have on you, well beyond your teen years, mm -hmm. um, it's right. it's really worth it's worth the risk. It's worth the the sort of the scariness at first. The you know, can I really do this? It's hard, but I know as a volunteer here locally that there's a lot of support. And when we run into somebody who's struggling a little bit, maybe with homesickness or whatever. There are a lot of people around who know what you're going through because they've gone through it themselves. And it's it's an incredible journey. And it is a journey, it's, it's not over. Well, this is a great segue, <laughs> unplanned by the way, for the journey because you know one of um, the things that we wanted to feature in this conversation with you, Joan, is that your journey has had different segments, right? So we've just talked a lot about your journey as an AFSer in Japan. Yeah. But um, I also 
would like you to first talk more about the second journey about being a volunteer, and then we'll talk a little bit about sure. your third journey of being, you know, a board member and supporter of the organization. <laughs> but it is a wonderful part of your story that not only did you have this wonderful life-changing experience, you are very motivated to give back locally. And could you talk a little bit about your role here in the capital team outside of Washington? Sure, DC? yeah. So um, being a volunteer locally is, and it, again, it's, it's cliche but true, and that is just my way of giving back because um, there were a lot of people who made my year in Japan special, mostly for me teachers. Um, I think it varies from country to country who it is who has the biggest impact on any student's year. But for me, it was it was my teachers. And so being a volunteer is, is my way of both giving back and paying forward. Um, and I, when you come into volunteering as a returnee, I think you do bring a lot of, of understanding, which is not to say that others can't be great volunteers, or we have lots of great volunteers who are not returnees, but you do bring something that, that others don't have. And so it's, it's definitely my way of um, giving back sort of in, in honor of all those teachers who were so terrific to me when I was in Japan. Um, what would you say was one of the most sort of surprising things that you experienced when you started vol volunteering locally? Like what kind of struck you as, you know, a benefit, I guess, like for you? I know you talk a lot about giving back, paying forward, but would you say that you also get something? Kind of oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. There are many times when I get something back. I mean, whether it's going to the airport to greet new students, and it's, it's always fun to go to the airport because I also get a chance to get to know the family right. who's waiting for the student. And often, it's very hard to time that, when do I arrive at the airport? So sometimes you have a lot of time with the family as you're standing there waiting for the students to come out of passport control. But um, it's, it's really a lot of fun to watch the students come through and meet their families for the first time. Um, I, orientations are probably one of my favorites. Um, and we, we have a lot of fun with our orientations here. We have um, a couple of volunteers who are great at getting the kids to do talent shows on a Saturday night. And uh, just watching the kids get to know each other and bond and laugh and and do silly things together um, is, a, is a lot of fun. It's also fun to, um, you know, as a liaison, we often have a student come for dinner or you know, something like that. And it's fun to, to not, now that I don't have my own daughters at home, it's not quite as much fun, but when they were home to, to bring somebody in, we had a student one year who was from Libya okay. and he came to dinner several times and really, um, bonded with my older daughter because they were close in age and he wanted to know, you know, what is she doing? What is she, what were her plans? And they, they talked a lot and, you know, he, he comes from such a different background and I'm happy to say he's actually now in Canada doing very well. Um, but it was, it really, um, gave me great joy to watch the two of them talk about what they wanted out of their futures. Also seems to me, I, I live very near here mm -hmm. and I, I don't go to a lot of things, but I do, when I do go, I'm always amazed and touched by the relationships within the team. Like it seems that the volunteers really do genuinely love to be together and yeah. Yeah. Um, that getting a lot of you know friendship out of that role. Yes, yes, yeah. Meeting people that I otherwise would not have met because it's a, it's a pretty, geographically, we have a huge team. And um, it's hard to get people together. And I never would meet these people otherwise without this. You know, one of, one of the women that I really 
a door lived in Alexandria, and I never would have gotten to know her in any other way okay. <laughs> except through Ava. So that's that's been really special. Anyway, I, the the friendships. It is true that we have a we have a, a good team, and it's it's you know every team has its its of course ups and downs, and COVID was tough, and we had to figure out how to rebuild. But I think we've we've done a pretty good job, and uh, we continue to get new team members, which is also really exciting. And my I'm the the volunteer coordinator, so I'm the one who reaches out to the new member and gets them involved or hopes to get them involved, find something. What do you, that what like do you do. think is influencing that to get a new volunteers coming into the team? Honestly, I I don't know. I mean, I'm wondering is is doing something <laughs> I just feel like suddenly we well we have seen an so insert, an new, increase I yeah. should say insert, an increase in new volunteers and um you know putting my positive hat on I like to think of it as I think after COVID a lot of people have just taken time to take stock of their lives and yeah. what do they want to do with their time and a lot of people who've come in have said I just wanted to do something more meaningful yeah I want to There's volunteer in a different way. So yeah. I think that is actually serving to be a, a positive after a very difficult time. A positive is that people are very thoughtful about their choices with yeah. how they volunteer. Yeah. No, I think you're right about that. And we're getting young people, um, right. which is, is great. We've also gotten some older people, which has been more challenging, honestly, because um, without the ability to get together for a while, they struggled. And, and we struggled to help them find an appropriate role because we, we need to be able to get together. So um, hopefully this, you know, here it is January and we're hoping that um, the rest of the year we won't have too many COVID hiccups and that we'll be able to do more in person and less on, you know, Zoom. But I, I've um, heard the story several times that when you first offered to volunteer in the team and they didn't quite know what to ask you to do. I said, I can go to this. You tell the story. <laughs> I, the, the job that I, <laughs> and part of it is, um, I'm not entirely comfortable in groups of people that I don't know. And so the job that I volunteered to do was to do the shopping. I said, I know how to shop. I can do that. I did that for a while, and actually now we've changed it. We don't even do that anymore. Wow. We have to, we have each of the kids bring something, <laughs> which I also think is a better way because you know then then they sort of get what they want, um, and yeah. But yeah, I used to. I think it's just a great that. example of like there is something for everybody, <laughs> you know, and yeah, um, it's just about putting that step forward, right? And yeah. getting getting started. And now here you're the volunteer coordinator and are you um what else do you do in well i'm the i'm the co-chair with jim okay. so that um becomes less and less of an important role because we have a lot of really strong leaders in their area so we have a really good orientation person and we have a really good support team and uh then we have people who are working on sending students oh. and uh so the volunteer coordinator me i i try as new people come in make sure that I figure that they let me know what they're interested in doing and then be sure that they get the emails. But we finally got a fairly coordinated system of, of reaching out to people, reaching it as, as many as we can, keeping that list right. updated so that when new people come on, they immediately get some kind of contact. And uh, it seems to be working, you know, every, every year is different. Um, and you just never know how things are going to change, but well, thank this you been a good year. for everything you do for the team because it's definitely a team that's getting stronger and stronger and, you know. Yeah, I think um, we're, in, we're in a good place right now. In the past few years, we have managed to pry open the doors of all the schools instead of just a few. And that's that's been, that's been huge. Right. And we are working very hard to reach out to PTAs, to reach out to neighborhood listservs, um, last year we had a very successful host family search. We started early, we had a number of people helping, and I think we had all of our students ho hosted before the summer. Yeah. 
and then we're asked even to, to do some additional ones and so that's that's our goal obviously again this year we'd all like to be done by the summer and uh, we'll see whether what we did last year is repeatable because you never right. know right. Um, but that's that's the goal is to do everything we did last year and maybe some new things too right I, I <laughs> that's that's definitely the spirit we want to go yeah. the country I, I bring up the school issue because I think every volunteer across the country working with hosting would would describe their situation with schools as being more complicated than it yes, used to be. That's absolutely and whether true. it's county or district or state or local, it just uh, means that we need to factor that planning in very early, right? We yes. need all yes. our teams to be thinking about what is the approach going to be to the schools, what will it work, differentiated approaches. And it's just becoming, you know, the first major milestone as we look at hosting is getting these schools um, secured. Mm -hmm. But also a lot of the work that we're doing to give back things to schools and more yes. resources to schools and um, making things more accessible to teachers across the country. And um, I know that's something the board's been very committed to and staff's mm -hmm. very committed to more resources. And But it's... It's also about storytelling, right? Because we want to get back to telling more of the yeah. stories after the students have either gone abroad from the U.S. and come back and they can talk about their impact when they come back, but what happens to our, our hosted students who go on to do amazing things, right? Because they've been so impacted by their AFS experience while they're here. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, in fact, just yesterday, I finished putting together, we are going to do the, the postcards. We have okay. 75 postcards. We've got all the addresses ready to go. The kids are going to do it at orientation. So you, so these are yeah, be so, um, and I think I know exactly how, I'm not the person who's, who received them, so I might not have all okay. the details. But it's a campaign to um, send out postcards around Valentine's Day and um, orientation is two weeks before Valentine's Day. So we have identified 75 schools in the area that have accepted students since um, 2009. Wow. I had to cut it off. I had originally started at 2005 and we had more than 75 and I only had 75 postcards. So, <laughs> so 2009 to 2022, we've had 75 schools in the area which is a pretty decent number. And we have, you know, about 35 kids, I think I said 35 or 36. So each student will be asked to write two postcards at orientation Sunday morning um, to say thank you to the schools. And for the ones who are keeping students, it's obvious they have a student, but for the ones who haven't for a few years, we're hoping that it will remind them that, right. exactly. that we're still here and uh, you know, we would love for them to take students again. And I'm sure Washington's not the only area, but we often bump up against the schools closing down by May. So we right. have to we have to work fast. Right. In fact, one of the schools that has a student this year had two slots for next year and has filled them both with somebody else. So so we know that we're already you know running right. to, to to catch up. Um, I have just you know we have to be sure that we that we make the school deadline and and it's often difficult to to time a, finding a family with still having a school open we have had families who've agreed to take students but their local school isn't available and that that then leaves us with well do we does the student bus off somewhere or do we lose this host family and right. it's, it's a tricky difficult situation so really getting ahead of the game and knowing you know your your data you could say like what are right. the deadlines yes what do yeah. i need to do to make this as easy as possible for the school and to show that we respect you know that the schools have they do have procedures deadline, you yeah. know and i think that that's we've certainly asking our AFS partners to send applications earlier and earlier. We've moved up the deadline this year because we also know we have to have those applications. And, right, you know, right. we need the recipe, is the family, the application, everything queued up so that the school um, also senses that we're organized and we're together and we know what, we know what we're doing. Right. right. So, so Joan, it's been great to hear about your journey as a student and a returnee and about your experience as a local volunteer, but you've also had a journey at the national level with AFS 
Service USA as a board member, as a former chair of the board, and much of that role is around helping to drive strategic priorities for the organization, but it's also about connecting with AFS partners around the globe as we are part of a network with over 50 AFS organizations. Right, Can you yeah. Talk a little bit about that experience? Sure. So in, in some ways, I, I went, I did it backwards. A lot of people start out as a volunteer and then eventually go on to the board. My husband and I got to a place where we wanted to give to the um, institutions that had helped us along the way. And for me, that was AFS and the University of Oregon. And so as, as we became regular donors, I think we became more uh, visible, <laughs> I guess. And eventually um, I was invited to, you know, some AFS events and I got to meet a lot of, of people that I had not you know, had not known before. I was not volunteering at the time and was invited onto the board, which um, was a really terrific experience. I had retired from the government and I um, just, I found a new purpose mm -hmm. on the board. It was, it was a very interesting time and it was a time too when AFS was looking for, um, a, a new way forward or a, a better way forward. Everybody was kind of reassessing and I and I was part of that as we made the first strategic plan and then right. I was there for the second str right. strategic plan. And I think that AFS really came out of both of those much stronger. Definitely. And so it was, it was very exciting to be a part of that and to meet um, people from the other, um, other parts of the network um, I w had the privilege of going on a, um, I think it was specific for board chairman, maybe right. a training in, in Madrid, yeah, yeah. Right, right. where I got to meet a number of, um, AFS board chairs and uh, that, that was a very worthwhile experience and I'm still in touch with, with a lot of them and I, I've, I've watched a lot of them. Um, you know, go on up through the ranks in, in, in AFS and onto the um, international board and so on. So that, that was great. Um, and it was, it was a real privilege to be, to be on that board and to be a part of that. And it was a both exciting, but, but it was a difficult time for AFS too, right. you know? We really uh, were challenged to figure out where do we go next and yeah. You know, I think we often talk about the mission as driving us, and that's, of course, the foundation. But I think the board has a very important responsibility to always be challenging the organization mm -hmm. and to be thinking about the future and yeah. sort of what's next. Right. right? Yeah. And looking for the best way to achieve that. Right. Yeah. And I think we did some really great work on that. It's always amazing in these international meetings um, when you meet board members and volunteers and staff from around the globe and you think, you know, all these people are interconnected and all of these people are working to, to, to push AFS to be better, to yeah. push AFS to be healthier. And uh, yeah. I know I find a lot of, you know, value in that being the motivation, you know, for me. And, yeah. yeah. So also as part of the 75th anniversary, we've really been focused on reaching out to our alumni and um, the board is, you know, very committed and challenged us in our last strategic plan, the, the most recent one, to be more focused on alumni and mm. um, alumni like you who have, you know, lived a great life, done great things um, to bring them back into the organization and to find meaningful ways, maybe not everybody is interested in being a local volunteer or doing, but there's something for everybody to do. And I, I just wondered if you might have a message to share to, to the alumni uh, who will be watching this about coming back in, giving back. What are your thoughts? About yeah, that? That, I, definitely my message would be to get involved. It's really, it's worth it. You can figure out how much or how little works for you. There's so many ways that you can get involved. Um, give back, pay forward, however you want to look at it. It's, it's well worth it. Remember all those people who helped you 
when you were a student. Um, as I as I said earlier, though, all of the teachers who really made my year incredible. This is my way of saying thank you. Um, and it's uh, you know it's 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 its own reward <laughs> to get involved. Right. It really adds a lot to a life. If you had to answer, you know, um, a sentence with a sentence, you know, how would you describe the AFS effect? What does it mean when someone says to you, "Oh, that's the AFS effect"? What do you What do you think? Yeah. Um, well, I think the effect on my own life and on and on my family's life has been pretty profound. That everything from that year in 1979 <laughs> led to where I am today. Um, where I went to school, where I got, where I ended up working, um, the kind of work I had, the kind of person I married, the kind of children I raised. I mean, it all traces itself back to AFS. So for me, it's a very straight line. That's the AFS and effect. Yeah, yeah, it may right, not right. be straight for everybody. It was right. straight for me. Right, right. Well, that's great. This has been so lovely and very Likewise. nice to see you again after nice a long time. But too. thank you, Joan, for everything you've You're done for welcome. AFS USA and what I know you'll continue. My pleasure, our pleasure. Do. So thank you. You're welcome.